this, but I think the limitation is again there because we're not designing the stuff to be like this. So I've worked with a company where they ship things physically on hard drives to be installed in shops. There is no internet connection there. There's, there's no way to update software quickly and things like that. But we said, we want to prove that this thing really works. So how much, you know, the, the, proving that this thing really works is valuable. How much money can we invest in proving that this thing really works? How much money can we invest in measuring these things? And, and then, you know, as a result of that, they ended up talking to one of their clients who has a shop near the development office, and they ended up agreeing that the development office can ship, you know, get somebody to physically come with software there every day, install a new version, and this shop will get free IT support for whatever they need. That, that was a cost that was justifiable by the um, act of measuring it, so they got a direct phone line to the chief architect to sort database problems if they exist. And the shop owners got early access to new features. So um, I think if we, if we are thinking about making assistance measurable for these things, very often we can actually find ways of doing it. You, you can um, you know, find a customer that's going to take an early release or, or find somebody who's going to prove that this thing is actually successful. Um, at the same time, you know, again, I'm sure this has limitations I, I've not really hit because of, I've, I've done it with a couple of my clients and you know everybody's environment is different. So in a case where you know you can't really get fast feedback, that, that really is, is the thing. Now the question is really not getting fast feedback, is that a conclusion or a problem statement? And if it's a problem statement, how do we you know resolve the problem statement in that particular environment? I like your tool. Um, many companies are attempting it in different ways. I mean, for instance, you've given the example of financial institutions. Some of the big banks use a gold question metric approach. Mm -hmm. And to refine that, they actually put in the, uh, during the question, who they're addressing, the actors. Mm -hmm. um, because many of the major software vendors, software, uh, software groups within a bank are used to using somatic and then rational rows and other requirements. Yep. So how, what's the biggest difference between the gold question metric and that approach? Because some of the banks are using gold question metric and aligning that to so, um, A-B testing. So I, I, I don't think that, that uh, you know, again, these are useful questions. It's kind of visualizing these assumptions and making sure they are communicated to the delivery team as well. Uh, I think the biggest difference is actually measuring. I, I work with quite a lot of big banks where, you know, there, there's, there, there is this idea of what the business goal is, but nobody proves that we have actually achieved it. It's, it's taken as a given that once you pass your tests, you have succeeded in, you know, you declare victory at this point, and it's no longer your problem. And I think what we need to do is we need to start closing that loop back. So uh, my experience is that in a lot of organizations, this information does exist. It's just not communicated. And it is not ever tested. OK, so if a company is, say, a web development company is using gold question metric and using A-B testing, they're collecting metrics of whether websites are used or not. There are quite a few case studies where companies they virtually ruin their finances by spending millions on development and the software is never bought. Mm -hmm. um, so the modern trend, although it's adopted by very few, mm -hmm. is to have A-B testing and then a link Absolutely. To, say, uh, to find out whether anybody would... So I think, I think that's, that, that's, that's, that's fantastically good <laughs> and I think that proves this level here. But again, you can have software that is really useful that is not driving in the right business direction you want. So I think you know the, the, the companies that are doing A-B testing on this level here, and I know I know a few there are doing really A-B testing on this level. I know one company based in London that with every user story, their business users have to give them K KPI changes. And what they will do is they will deploy software on 10% of their systems, they will measure KPI changes, they will measure success. And they will not just measure KPI changes in isolation, they will measure the difference between KPI changes on that 10% and the other, because maybe there's just a surge in usage. And kind of, you know, if, if the figures are the same on both, then we know that this user story is not really creating this change. 
And what they'll do is if, if the user story is not going in the right direction, they will throw the code away because it was not successful. So th there are companies doing that, and again, this is not nothing new. This is kind of, you know, people have been struggling with this for the last 50 years. And people have been writing about this for the last 50 years as well. It's just that um, this visualization for me is kind of, there are three aspects to this that I found really good. First of all, it's visual. Unlike tables, unlike kind of bureaucratic models, and as you know, in, in um, Emmanuel, I ended, I ended up talking about iStar, which is um, a, a model that's getting more popular in academia where um, I, I think it's just over complicated. There's, there's four types of arrows there, if I'm correct, and, and there's seven types of boxes or something like that. Each, each line means something different, so it's, it's really complex. Where this thing is simple, you can go and explain it to senior business people. They get it, and and you can you know they, they can understand it relatively quickly. So again, with, with the simplification, you lose completeness. And the question is really where are the limits of this? What have we lost from five different types of arrows and seven types of boxes that are not showing here? Uh, and uh, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that it's really collaborative. So from because it's kind of um, Visual and collaborative, you can get senior business and technical people to get into a good argument about this. And the third thing is, it's incredibly fast. So I did this with um, one of the biggest banks in the city on, on, on their project, and um, the analysts that were there were claiming that they would get to the same results using their normal techniques. And which is, why not? You know. But one of the senior analysts there said, yeah, but can we, do the thing? we will do this in about six months. And we did it in three days of this. So, from my experience, it's, it's a lot faster than anything else. And then, the, the, because it kind of helps, as, as David Sibbett says, you know, visualization brings out 80, 80 more IQ points and it gets kind of the knowledge, <coughs> knowledge out. Um, so, it's much faster than other things, which means it fits in nicely with short iterative cycles. Because if you have to spend six months getting to this result, you can't really deliver very quickly. If you can get an agreement in a couple of days, then you can start working on something, prove that it does or not, and, and do something else. So I think those are the key things. And I think with A-B testing, this will actually inform what you want to A-B test. So A-B testing is a fantastic thing to do. And I, I do A-B testing for everything in my business now. We kind of, you know, every time we send emails, we send two or three different types of emails, measure how they're doing, then kind of run this. I do A-B testing on my course titles. In Estonia, kind of, um, we had a course that wasn't selling that well, and I just told them, let's, you know, they said, we, well, we think, you know, the title is, is not the caption, so let's, let's put the same description, don't change description, use two different titles, see which one people book, and we realized that this other thing, people book more, and we realized that in Estonia, people don't read the course description. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's my learning from it, so it's, it's um, kind of proving success, really, and um, so I think maybe, you know, lots of companies will already do traces of this. I think the power of this is kind of to unify the whole thing. Yeah, I, I like it to in fact. The, I mean, I do agree that KPIs aren't always addressed. But I think the great thing about that that you've introduced tonight is something that our colleagues at UCL are working on, is this promotes the idea of actors, and often they have different uh, requirements within mm -hmm. the project. And this actually emphasizes that point of actors and the different perspectives. So I, I think, you know, from that, if I understand the goal modeling thing right, and I'm, I'm completely divorced from academia, so maybe I got it wrong, but um, these kind of are actors' goals, but they're also actors' goals that contribute to some overall business perspective that you want to promote with this milestone, which is, again, reducing a lot of scope creep, because um, in, in too many organizations that I work with, kind of just, people just want too much. And um, there, there's a fantastic book by Scott Birkun, um, who was the program manager for Excel in 2004. And uh, the, the book is called The Art of Project Management, I think. So uh, he describes the process they were using to prevent scope creep in Excel there. Because this is one of the biggest problems they had as Microsoft and Excel is that too many stakeholders, too many actors, too many people wanting different things. And then every release of Excel basically does 10% for everybody, 100% for nobody. So he said, what we want to do is limit the number of business goals and push the decision which five business goals gets implemented to the right people. 
And rather than developers deciding, you know, which business goals get implemented or even not knowing about that, they were limiting every release of Excel to a number of business goals that people had to kind of, the, the high business community had to decide. And then everything anybody wanted that went in that direction went into this, this release. If it didn't go in that direction, it didn't go to that release. So I think the real power of this is also, you know, putting the... Putting this level into the perspective of this level here. Because with complex organizations, lots of actors, lots of goals, you can have something that's useful to somebody, but is it, you know, is it the Hoover promotion usefulness or is it some other usefulness? I think this is useful if, if, if you are in that position, you're in that empowered position, you can have those conversations. Mm -hmm. but I'm a CTO myself, so I can have those conversations with my directors and things. But I think the previous life, when a marketeer or a salesman or a customer has already defined the requirement, and you're, you, you haven't got much um, breadth to have that kind of conversation mm -hmm. about, you know, is this, this is really a valuable requirement, mm -hmm. and this may be a better way to do it. You mm -hmm. try to, but sometimes it's quite difficult. So, looking at this, I think, you know, this is using your GPS analogy. I mean, if you're the captain of the ship, or on the bridge, the navigator, then you, know, you stand a great, great chance of being successful with this, but if you're in the engine room, not, not, not quite so much. So, <laughs> there, there, there's, there's um, I think you're absolutely right. So the, 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 that's, uh, uh, you know, I think um, the real problem with this is <coughs> mid-level management. Not, not the engine room. The engine room guys, I, I think, are, from, in my experience, very motivated when they see how their work contributes to the business goals. Yeah. The, the problem is the mid-level management that's kind of responsible for ticking the boxes. So, you know, this project manager got to deliver this report. He's not measured on one million plans. He's measured on delivering levels and achievements. And his incentive is to go and deliver levels and achievements even if that kills the company. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that that's, that's one major limitation of that. I think um, my kind of skewed version of the world is skewed because I often get called by people who are high enough to actually cause a change. <coughs> and then I get to kind of get the right people in the room. And I think if you can't get senior business and technical people in the room, this is just not going to work. So, um, <coughs> At the same, nothing else will work either. If you can't <laughs> that yeah. yeah. So, I, I, but I think you know, the, 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 at the same time, I found too many people who don't even try. And, and the uh, we were talking about this um, outside of the room um, or, or a coffee before this thing started. Uh, I, I worked with this team uh, a couple of years ago where we had two scum slaves. Uh, do you guys know what scum slaves are? Have you heard of that term? Have you heard of scum masters? <laughs> well, you, know, you can't really be a driver if you don't own a car. So, um, so scum, slaves is, is, scum slave is a name for a business person who is assigned to a project against their will. They really don't want to be there. Um, these are typically people whose time is expendable. Somebody from the call center who knows how the business works, who can you know, waste a lot of time with the team because the really important people don't have to waste time with them. And, we worked with this team where um, the two scum slaves were actually making decisions. And as a slave, you kind of don't really have a lot of authority. So your decisions don't really matter. And when the sales director came down from heaven every two months, he would break everything. And everybody's an idiot and everybody's a moron. And, and we said, look, you can't keep doing this to us because you know, we, we waste a lot of time. Then you come in and you change all the decisions. You know, your guys told us this, and he said, well, they're morals as well, and you know, whatever. And for us as a delivery team, we took them as the business, because they're the business people. And I think this kind of, you know, told me that we are working with the wrong people. So we told this guy, look, we need your time. We need you to come in every two weeks, spend two hours with us, and we're going to give you the problems, you make the decisions, and help us do this. And he said, I'm too busy. And we said, of course you're too busy, but um, have you thought about it this way? If this is not worth two hours of your time every two weeks, why is it worth 20 people's full time? Why, why, you know, if this is not important <coughs> enough for you to come in, let's do something that is. Let's stop this because it's not that important. Let's do something that is important. And he said, I, I don't understand. He said, well, you know, 
is this really important for the company? He said, yes, this is crucial. I said, well, it cannot possibly be crucial and not worth two hours of your time every two weeks. So which one is it? He said, but only two hours. So we called his secretary, we booked a meeting every second Friday from 3 to 5. We'd kind of do a prep, get all the questions, run in his office with a mobile whiteboard and get his time. Um, at the same time, when I've done this with some other projects, we've ended up concluding that, no, it's not that important. And we said, let's then not waste time on this, let's do something that is. So I think you're right, if, if, if you don't get these people in the room, nothing's going to come out. But the other question is, um, are, you, are you at least trying to get them in the room? And for, for a large majority of teams that I've worked with over the last five or six years, the answer is no. Do you think as well, as it's now 20 plus years, mm. where you've been saying all you have to do is get the users there, and now we've got Agile saying it and every other method, all you have to do is get the users. In my experience is exactly what you've said over, goodness knows how many years. They are not the people who will reinvent the business. They are not the people who can make the decisions. So all these theories, the books, etc., about agile, you just get the etc. Et so you just get the people in the room, the users, and all your problems will be solved. Well they just not Okay, so for, first of all I think there's two things there. My, my understanding of Agile is not what you said. So Agile is not about just get users in the room and everything's gonna be rosy. Well, just no no but but okay so that, that's again I I, I I don't think that that's agile, but just getting users in the room and giving, giving them free reign is not going to work, in my experience. There's, there's a fantastic book called What Users Want by Anthony Ulrich, who was the program manager for PC Junior. PC Junior was a $2 billion failure uh, based on a lot of user research. IBM built exactly what the users told them they want through lots of user research and stuff like that, and it was a $2 billion failure. And kind of um, what users want is kind of his uh, um, way of repenting and, and you know, um, uh, uh, catharsis of what went wrong. And one of the key things he says there is uh, forget what users tell you they want, figure out what job they want to do, and then figure out ways of actually doing that better. And I think um, going back to uh, the, the um, Brinkerhoff stuff is don't just think about the job that they're trying to do. Figure out what is the change in that job that you want to support. Because, I exactly agree. And, and then kind of, you know, the, the, the software thing, the requirements, delivery, testing, everything should be kind of secondary to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the, 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 the thing I like about this, this visualization is it just makes us ask the right questions. It's just a structured discussion to remember to ask these questions. And, you know, I think. Um, as, as a professional software developer, tester, analyst, my, my job is really to deliver this thing here. And uh, my job is to help the business users express what, they, express what they need so I can try to kind of fulfill that, not to trust everything they say. Um, but I don't, I don't think that kind of, you know, that, that has nothing to do with Agile or non-Agile. So I think that the description of Agile is wrong and blaming Agile for not working in that way is kind of, I think, a um, wrong expectation. Okay, um, I don't want to drag this out, but I wasn't particularly talking about Agile either. I was talking uh, it's quite simply about this mentality that has this belief, perhaps, that what you have to do is involve users. But for me, the general users out there uh, I believe I'm saying exactly what you were saying. Okay. They're not the people who are going to reinvent the business. I don't know what that is, because actually you're, you, you've, you've got different personas and different stakeholders who may have different goals than person who yes. bills, yeah. may have different goals than, than the end user. Mm. How would you represent that on, on, on here? Different, different actors? Different actors, yeah. There's a kind of, uh, there's, um, I, I like actor, kind of, we used stakeholder for a while as the name for that, but then people outside of the UK got confused. Because um, stakeholder for people in the UK is anybody who has a stake and uh, you know, your users, your decision makers and stuff like that. The way people translate that to other languages is, is decision maker. And then kind of, okay, how do I show my users there? I say, well, users are stakeholders. I say, well, what do you mean users are stakeholders? And, and kind of we realized we, we're really, you know, we need another name for this. And then kind of, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And, um, 
A couple of people from the product development community got involved and they said, well, you know, there's a concept of an actor already. And we have a really good kind of, you know, classification of actors that already exists in use case modeling and things like that. So there's primary actors. Primary actors are the people who are going to use this. There are secondary actors who are not really kind of people who are going to use this, but are providing kind of a service to this. So, um, and there are kind of off-stage actors that are not people who use this or not providing service, but have an interest in this. So you have the, the um, in this case here, you have the, you know, uh, settlement operations user who is the primary actor. He, he uses this thing, but then we have um, people who are traders who are kind of pushing trades to the operations users. They're not the primary actors of this, but they're the secondary actors. And we have regulators who are not really going to use the system at all, but have an interest in making this work. And I think all these you know, decision makers in the company, like the marketing director, is a secondary actor. So I think kind of thinking about actors and that way capturing kind of the important actors here is also very, very uh, useful to see who else and what else. Because if this is what we want to achieve, very often there's somebody else who can help us achieve this, or somebody who can obstruct us from getting there, that we want to change their behavior is kind of, you know, allowing us to proceed with this. Do you have an example of how you could, you could show that? I'm just struggling to visualize So, okay, so we have... Um, let's say um, our goal is to reduce transaction cost by 10%. That's the business goal. Um, people who could help out the settlement ops, what they could do is process important exceptions faster. That's that user story we started with. And what we could do are kind of a bunch of reports to help them do that. Um, what they could also do is process fewer transactions manually because that's going to reduce transaction cost as well. And then we can think about how we support this. But then, and this is kind of from a real project. I'm just not. I'm, I'm trying to hide the uh, real situation because it's not. I'm not allowed to really give you um, this. <laughs> But the, the, for example, we, we said, well, if this is what you're trying to achieve, who else is there? And how else, you know, why, why is, you know, what's another way of reducing transaction cost? And we said, well, IT operations can run the system cheaper. A lot of cost comes from IT. So to run the system cheaper, we can start decommissioning hardware, we can start consolidating architecture and things like that. That's what we want to achieve. And then the question is, is this cheaper than this thing? And we said, okay, traders, traders basically, what they're doing at the moment is they're pushing in a bunch of trades through, um, the, 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 what they were doing, what these guys were doing is they were using a field that was for exceptions to communicate amongst themselves what this thing was doing because there was no additional field for some other information. And then it was hitting the settlement operations because it wasn't one of the standard codes, so they had to review a lot of these things. And a lot of the review was just, okay, this is their thing. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not really an exception. It's not an exception. It's not an exception. We said, okay, what we could do is, what they could do is communicate different ways. So using, use, use uh, trade notes to communicate. And we said, okay, maybe we are the field that's a communication note on this. So we can change the traders' behavior, not, not just the settlement jobs' behavior. So this level starts becoming anybody who can help achieve this goal, or anybody who has an interest in kind of doing this. And then we can start thinking about well, which one of these things is more likely to kind of drive us in the right direction. How do we test that? And the, the end result of this was actually not delivering software at all. It was talking to traders to kind of stop using this field and start using some other field. And this reduced the cost. So we didn't end up delivering any software. We can solve the business problem without increasing the cost of software maintenance. Without so the the um, again one of the nice things about that is it really positions deliverables in terms of the things we need to achieve. So you can capture non-software options as well. 
how do you deal with uh, when you've got more than one business goals and they're conflicting? So, for example, you had a goal of instead of reducing costs, mm -hmm. you also want to increase revenue. So, I, I, I think that, that that's where you know, iterative delivery really comes in because I tell people let's do one thing at a time. Let's let's you know if we if we're thinking about we, we have this thing with the, the big bank in, in the Nordics where they had. 70 pages of business case documents when I started looking at the project and in the 70 pages of business case documents there were things like uh, delighting users and then a whole two page on how this is going to delight users and then reducing IT cost and then reducing credit risk and, and, and a bunch of other things and then we kind of split into groups and we try to identify what are, what, are the, what are the whys, what are the different why options there and let's then work on one at a time. So we listed about 19 in total and for 17 they couldn't tell me how they could actually measure this. And we decided these, these things are non-deliverable. So we ended up with two, reduce IT cost and reduce credit risk. And we said, let's, let, let's think about it this way. So first of all, my question was, if we hit the credit risk goal, so there was a goal of reduce credit risk by 30%, there was a goal of reduce IT cost by 20%. So if we hit the credit risk goal, but we miss the other one, so, if I reduce your credit risk by 30%, but I increase your IT cost by 5, will everybody get fired? Is this a massive failure? Are we going to close this thing? And the head of credit risk says, are you crazy? If you reduce my credit risk, I won't give you the money. Okay, it doesn't matter. I'll pay 5% more. So, we said that kind of reducing IT cost is really not part of this thing. So, one way is actually comparing these things. The other way is saying, okay, if we have reduced transaction cost and increased revenue, I would create two maps for that. And I could say, first of all, can I reduce transaction cost by 10% first? If it's going to take too long to do this, then let's not do it by 10%, let's do it by 2% as the first slice. And then we're going to work on this. Then I'll come back to this, then I'll come back to that. So you can, you can inter, you know, intersect these things. Um, you could possibly kind of put both in the center and then think about what contributes to both. I don't know. That, that's, that's an interesting thing to try. But um, I think the nice thing about um, iterative delivery is that we can, we can get people to start thinking about one thing at a time. And actually going and hitting that and then, and then proceeding to the next one. So, um, or at least that's what that, so far I've been able to do that when I've worked with people. Again, I'm, I'm not claiming this works for everybody. Um, it's an interesting thing to try. But yeah, so to answer your question, my, my, my three options were try to compare the goals and eliminate some. If, kind of, once you narrow down the list, try to kind of convince people to work on one at a time. And if that doesn't work, then kind of slice them so it's not by 10%, but it's by 2%, and then kind of go and deliver the other thing. I mean, I've used systems thinking style diagrams of effects with goals to prove that they are conflicting sometimes. I don't know if that ties in here. It's Possibly. actually one of the questions I've got. I've got about a dozen questions. I won't bore everyone. I won't um, Probably one of the most straightforward questions, though, is that um, you made a comment about reverse engineering backlog, and I'm actually wondering that for some, most teams, whether or not if you've got a decent map, you actually get much value out of maintaining any sort of backlog. So I, I've worked, uh, since I started using maps, I've worked with teams that actually use a map and then have five or six user story connect, stories connected to the, the, the active level three node. Yeah. And th th this is kind of a backlog. This is the visual backlog. But it's, it's not fully developed, but it's a growing and shrinking backlog. So when I was talking about reverse engineering backlog, I was talking about a couple of projects where you know, people called me, they had one and a half years of things in the pipeline. And the question was, what do we do with this? And, and there's a lot of investment already in that. So if you're just going to tell them, let's throw this whole thing away, people will revolt. Um, and what, what I did in those cases, start kind of figuring out how many business goals do we really have in that one and a half years? How do we start slicing this? So we took some of the critical things and reverse engineered the actual kind of changes there. And, and when we done this with a big bank, um, they ended up not doing the one and a half years of rewriting the legacy system, but actually doing something that, once they understood what, what this thing is, the technical people suggested doing it in Excel and they completed the thing in a week. Yeah. yeah. 
So I mean, there's, you know, this to me actually provides a very good tie-up between the kind of lean product development hypothesis-based approach to yeah, yeah. So it yeah. kind of fits perfectly with that. What we, um, and again, the very fractal nature, we sort of spoke about going down to the user story, but bringing it back up. Um, you know, I'm very keen on using throughput-based governance to unlock a lot of the kind of issues that you've raised in terms of making sure that things are valuable working. Have you gone much further up the tree with this to look at how these goals work in a kind of portfolio? Or so there's, there's, a, um, there's, a company, there's a company here in London that does uh, viral advertising, and what they've realized is that on a whole portfolio level, um, this, is, this is too low level. As, yeah. as you said, and, and what they realize is, but it's still it's still useful way of thinking. So they do two levels of maps actually. Yeah. So they do a map level and a portfolio level where you have a vision, vision for the whole portfolio, mm. and then you have your uh, user groups or user segments and their kind of their needs, and you have kind of pro product milestones. And it's basically the same thing. It's kind of this is why we're doing it. This is who. This is how. And, and this is. And then, for each of these product milestones, this becomes the center. This becomes the why for a lower level map. Yeah. And and they would kind of divide this among different teams and let them run on lower level maps while still coordinating the measurements yeah. for the high level thing. Because the other thing I'm quite keen on is it's very easy to jump from this to a diagram of effects where you're looking at other factors that may. That may have impacts um, to, to come up with a possibly. But the question is, you know, can you capture the effects like this? Because this is really capturing effects. It's capturing impacts and effects and things like that. So um, it's it is easy to jump, you know, from one thing to another. And again, the, the, the real question is with the you know, looking at the more complex models and this thing. It's really really simple. You get speed, you get usability, but you lose. Completeness and the question is what have we lost in the process? Mm. Another another question I had is that um, particularly when looking at prioritised sets of requirements, um, cost of delay is actually one factor which is quite often used to do prioritisation. The, the temporal aspect being key to to that. How would you suggest that kind of thing would fit into this model? In terms First of all, there are no requirements. You do level three. There are no requirements. There's no cost of delay because this is level three. The question is, what is the cost of delay on the behavioral change? What is the cost of delay of settlement ops not processing important exceptions faster compared to the cost of delay of IT people not running the system cheaper? And then you can kind of put in some tests and you can say, you know, well, if we improve something here and if we improve something there, what is the, what is the overall effect? I guess if you've got a model cost of delay, you could do that at the next level up anyway, if you have a, if you have a model on the main goal. So uh, 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 if, if reducing cost is here, then mm. cost of delay is, is going to play a very yeah. important role there. But then I said, the cost of delay is, I think, not the cost of delay in releasing a software feature, because that's irrelevant. It's the cost of delay of changing somebody's behavior. So that's why I think you know, the cost of delay should be worked on this level, not on on this level here. Yeah. And then you can think about well, <coughs> what is the minimum thing I can do to start doing something here. Like the invitations button that's not fully functioning, that's dumping emails and we can start doing things manually. And, and what you said is kind of you know this fits in with the whole lean startup thing because you can start doing the you know the, the, the man behind the curtain thing. Yeah. Where you deliver something there and you kind of you provide a half manual service, you reduce your cost yeah. of delay. Because when you look at the hierarchy of need, actually the hierarchy of need is quite slow. Yeah, it's, like it's, down, it's right? just slice. Like, yeah. <coughs> Maybe you could have just one last quick question because I've heard they've set up the, the food. <laughs> and you know, we, we, can, we can chat. We, we can, can chat. chat. Yeah. Can you just explain really what the essential difference between this is and um, effect map? So, uh, in use effect mapping is done once per a large project before the start of a project. It is, it is used to create a huge map that kind of reduces scope but not to measure the outcomes. And I think another crucial difference between this and effect mapping is that effect mapping focuses on user needs, on, on user goals, and this thing focuses on behavioral changes that we want to promote. So that's kind of a subtle difference there. 
but I think a difference that opens up a good, good, uh, open, good discussion on measurements. So this is a, you know, I, 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 I tell people this is a variation of effect mapping, and we used to call this thing effect mapping. Um, I stopped calling it effect mapping for two reasons. Reason number one is that in Sweden, that the home of Indians, people started blaming me for misrepresenting effect mapping. <laughs> And I, I said, it's not, you know, this is a, another idea. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's the same visualization, but use it iteratively. Don't use it at the start of the project. And then a um, couple of people complained that the effect mapping that's kind of, you know, these Swedes came up with as the name is not what a native English speaker would, would say. And I'm, I'm not a native English speaker, so I have no opinion about that. But they, you know, the, the argument was that you don't say, I want to make an effect in my life. You say, I want to make an impact. So. And, and kind of again, the um, impact mapping is sufficiently similar to effect mapping to you know to tell you that it's a similar thing, but I guess sufficiently different so nobody can say that we're misrepresenting it. Um, I kind of disagree on, with what the Swedes say about uh, native English. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can I have no opinion on that. So, um, but um, I think yeah, I, I think. When you think about software making an impact on somebody's behavior, I think that kind of opens up a good discussion. So that's why I, kind of, I, I, I like calling these things impacts, not effects. Okay. So okay. Sure, thank you very thank much. You. So, uh, you, you will profit tonight uh, out of UPS's incompetence. Uh, I, I, I was speaking at a conference in Berlin um, last week and they were supposed to deliver some stuff for me so I can ship it to Berlin. And they claimed that uh, th there was nobody uh, at the reception of an office building that staffed 24 7 to accept these things. So, you know, they had to re deliver, and, and uh, the books came in late. So, I have a copy of a book actually explaining what mapping for everybody. Um, I think so, it stands for Oops Late Again. Yes, Oops <laughs> Late Again. So, please, if, if you are interested, please do come and, and you know, take a copy of the book. Um, that's it. Okay. <laughs>